Okay, so welcome everyone. It's two minutes past three and we're really, really excited to have so many colleagues join us, uh, Emerge Africa members and beyond uh, for this seminar or webinar on uh, 4IR and what it means for African universities. So today we are joined by Professor Chalitsi Marawala, who is the Vice Chancellor and Principal of the University of Johannesburg. And prior to this, he was the Deputy Vice Chancellor for Research and Internationalization and Executive Dean of Engineering in the Built Environment, both at the University of Johannesburg. And he was recently appointed as the Deputy Chair of the Presidential Commission in South Africa on the 4IR uh, revolution, Fourth Industrial Revolution. So what some of you might not know is that Prof M is also an accomplished scholar. He's got a very um, multidisciplinary research interests that include theory and application of artificial intelligence to engineering, computer science, finance, social science, and medicine. He's got a very extensive track record in human capacity development and has published 15 books in artificial intelligence. So human capacity development is what Emerge Africa is all about, especially for our colleagues um, across the continent who are now you know, very much more in the educational technology space than before. So over to you, Prof M. Thank you, thank you very much uh, for the invitation. I'm actually quite excited to uh, be speaking to you uh, today on the fourth industrial revolution and its implication on higher education. Uh, this week, uh, Rhodes University's former Vice Chancellor, Professor Salim Badat, wrote a response to an article I had written last week. A critical thrust of the article was that um, uh, the, 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 the article that he wrote, and I support his, uh, his sentiments, is that the fourth industrial revolution should not just be for engineers and technologists. The conversations and the implementations of the fourth industrial revolution must actually also involve people from the social sciences and the humanities. Now, I would like to, the way I am going to uh, structure this talk, firstly, I will talk about what the fourth industrial revolution is all about. I will illustrate uh, some of the examples uh, in which the fourth industrial revolution is changing our society. Then I'm going to talk about uh, the presidential commission on the fourth industrial revolution because the recommendations are out. Uh, for those of you who, who might um, uh, um, uh, follow uh, the Mail and Guardian, I wrote an article, a series of articles, eight of them, on uh, eight recommendations of the fourth industrial revolution. I will also talk about uh, uh, the fact that uh, our president is also the chairman of the African Union. And uh, when he was accepting the chairmanship, he took one of the recommendations of the Fourth Industrial Revolution Commission uh, and uh, made it one of his deliverables uh, in the continent. And then I will talk about um, uh, what does the Fourth Industrial Revolution actually mean uh, to education, how we train people, uh, and so on and so forth. Now, what is this thing called the Fourth Industrial Revolution? For us to understand the fourth industrial revolution is perhaps important for us to understand other industrial revolutions. The first industrial revolution happened in England. Uh, it happened in England uh, in the 1700s. Uh, and the root or the genesis of the first industrial revolution uh, is not really known. But uh, speculations are that uh, it was a direct consequence of what is called the uh, scientific revolution. Uh, for those of us who studied science, we know about Newton and his loss of motion. 
Do we know about his uh, perception of gravitation? He actually invented the concept, even though much later Albert Einstein uh, generalized it. Uh, 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 we know about his invention of uh, co-invention of calculus with Leibniz. All those um, achievements in the scientific world uh, actually led to uh, the first industrial revolution. And because of that scientific uh, uh, knowledge, we were able to basically use steam engine to make machines that were used for transportation, for example, in trains, but, they were, but that were also used for production. And when the first industrial revolution came about, not everybody was happy. There was a group of people uh, in, in, in England called, um, uh, later they were called the Luddites. These were the people who were saying, uh, no, this uh, first industrial revolution is taking away our jobs. What do we do about it? And what they will do, they will sneak into factories at night and they will destroy machines. Of course, uh, the fourth industrial, the first industrial revolution marched on and the Luddites disappeared. Now came the second industrial revolution. And the genesis of the uh, second industrial revolution is a, is a scientific notion called electromagnetism. Electromagnetism is such a powerful uh, concept. Uh, it changed the face of science. It ultimately led to uh, Einstein's theory of uh, relativity, and it ultimately uh, changed the way we produce goods and services, and it gave us electricity, for example. Now, what is this thing called electromagnetism? Uh, basically, it's a basic concept. It basically says that if you have a conductor that is transmitting electricity, there is a magnetic field around it. In other words, whenever there is an electric a conductor next to a magnet and you put electricity through the magnet, the conductor moves. And from that, uh, an electric motor was discovered and an electric motor is what is used to move stuff. Whether it is in our airports when we are waiting for our goods, uh, you see that conveyor belt uh, bringing your bags uh, that is uh, an electric motor. If you go to factories and you see all these um, uh, 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 you know, products being produced in an assembly line, that is an electric motor. So it came out of uh, the theory of uh, electromagnetism. Uh, the people who are uh, associated with it is, uh, is an English person called Michael Faraday. The theory itself was developed by uh, James Clerk Maxwell. Then came the third industrial revolution. Again, it had something to do with uh, electricity. Uh, you have something that conducts electricity under certain conditions. Uh, you know, uh, uh, they are called semiconductors because they are not fully conductors. They are semi because they are not fully conductors. They conduct electricity under certain conditions because they are able to, uh, to, 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 to conduct electricity under certain conditions. They can be used as very efficient switches. And we know the concept of communicating with ones and zeros, which actually predated the electronic age. It was used during the time of a telegram where you were just switching on and off a, a button and somebody on the other side will record um, the switching on and off as ones and zeros and will translate that into a message. So what uh, uh, the uh, semiconductors through an invention called a transistor uh, gave us is the electronic age, computers, uh, and so on and so forth. And now we're living in the fourth industrial revolution. It is a confluence of technologies in the digital space. Let me use the word cyber, because in the fourth industrial revolution, 
Computers are no longer just digital. They no longer just communicate with ones and zeros. They can also communicate uh, 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 in other ways. For example, a quantum computer uses quantum mechanics or theory, quantum theory in order to communicate uh, messages. And then you have uh, developments in, in, in robotics. Then you have developments in uh, biotechnology. So the confluence of developments in biotechnology, in cyber, uh, cyber technologies, in what we call physical technologies, actually give us the fourth industrial revolution. That is why sometimes, uh, especially at the World Economic Forum, uh, there is uh, 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 another way in which uh, sometimes they express the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, they call it uh, the cyber physical biological systems. So that is uh, the fourth industrial revolution. And one piece of technology that is actually revolutionizing um, uh, 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 much of, uh, of, 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 the, of our society is what is called artificial intelligence. And by the way, uh, we just uh, published a book uh, on the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, in fact, um, the chairman of the World Economic Forum wrote uh, a foreword of our book on the fourth industrial revolution. So now, uh, uh, the technology that is very dominant in the fourth industrial revolution. There are many technologies. 3D printing, internet of things, blockchain that is used uh, in, in, in cryptocurrencies, um, artificial intelligence, uh, robotics, um, gene editing, all these things are actually what uh, is uh, collectively called the fourth industrial revolution. Now, what are some of the things that uh, uh, some of these technologies are able to do? Now we know about artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence basically has, there are three types of artificial intelligence, broadly speaking. You have what is called machine learning, which is the use of data and statistics to build machines that are intelligent. So artificial intelligence is the art of making machines that are intelligent. And there are three ways in which you can be able to do that. In machine learning, which is the first way, you use data and uh, statistics to make machines intelligent. In the second um, type, uh, this is what is called computational intelligence. That is actually looking at the way nature works and creating algorithms that are actually intelligent. In fact, the whole concept of, um, of uh, uh, computational intelligence emanated in South Africa. Uh, there was uh, an African a poet called Eugene Manet. He came from the part of South Africa that is now called Limpopo province. Coincidentally, I come from Limpopo province. He wrote a book uh, that was based on his extensive study of ants. Uh, the name of the book was uh, 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 The Sylph and the Meal. Uh, which uh, that is uh, the Afrikaans uh, uh, title, uh, which is translated into English um, as uh, the soul of the white ant. He was studying these uh, uh, ants and he realized that they make this sophisticated ant hills. And in fact, now we know that uh, uh, what is underneath uh, the, the, the hill that we see uh, is even much richer. Uh, uh, what is on the ground is even much more richer than what you see on the surface. The air conditioning of that uh, ant hill 
is so sophisticated and so efficient that engineers cannot be able to design air, condition, air, air conditioning to that level. But all that is made by an end. And obviously, he rightly concluded that uh, the ends must be intelligent. For example, for those of you who have observed ends, sometimes you realize that they, they, they form a straight line. If you check where that straight line is coming from, you will realize that it is actually coming from the nest of the ants and where it is going to is the food source. What is actually quite interesting is that that path that they actually use is the shortest distance between the nest and the food source. Of course, uh, computer scientists take that whole concept and construct an algorithm called ant colony optimization, which is actually used in our digital maps to uh, find shortest distances between two points. This is what we call computational intelligence. And then the third type of uh, artificial intelligence is soft computing. Soft computing is based on what is called fuzzy logic. Things are fuzzy. Um, uh, and, it, and it is actually quite uh, useful if you do not have precise data, an issue that is actually quite widespread in our continent. Again, all these three types have been used to build sophisticated uh, applications such as uh, medical diagnostics tools. Uh, me and uh, my collaborators, uh, Mayor Peretz and David Rubin, uh, we actually used um, uh, fuzzy logic uh, to create a system uh, that used microarray uh, arrays uh, to basically predict some form of tensors. So that is actually quite uh, 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 quite uh, exciting. The other applications that we have done, it is in the area of politics. I actually wrote a book on this with uh, Monica Lagazio from, from Eton. Interstate conflict. Can machines be able to tell us whether two countries are going to go to war? Can artificial intelligent machines be able to tell us whether two countries are going to go to war? And of course, uh, yes, they, could be, they can be able to do that. In fact, uh, our book on this uh, has been translated by the Chinese uh, military uh, press uh, into Mandarin. It uses um, variables such as distances between two countries to be shared, border, uh, is one of the country or both of them a superpower or none of them. If none of them, we give it a zero. If one is a superpower, we give it a one. If both are superpower, we give it a two. Um, the degree of uh, uh, of, 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 of trade between two countries, uh, the degree, the, whether two countries are democracies, if both of them are democracies, we give them a, a 13. Uh, if uh, none, uh, we give it a zero. If it is uh, then somewhere in between. And again, we could be able to use the tools of the fourth industrial revolution to build machines that are able to predict interstate conflict. Today, we train political scientists to do exactly that. Given the fact that machines are now being used to make decisions that used to be done by human beings, do we, should we still train our political scientists the way we have been training them? I don't think so. I think a political scientist of today must actually understand data, how to manipulate data, how to use machines to be able to untangle some of the complexity that lie in data. So in other words, yes, they should go and take social science classes, um, politics, and so on and so forth. But in addition, they should also take technological subjects. The same goes 
with doctors. The fact that me and David and uh, Maya uh, we were able to build a system that is able to do something that is done by doctors. It basically means that our training of medical practitioners must now incorporate technology more than ever before. We have something uh, in artificial intelligence called natural language processing. Natural language processing is when you build artificial intelligent machines so that they are able to understand somebody when they speak. See this an example of natural language processing. What we are finding now is that many of these systems perform very poorly on African languages. If you just go to Google Translate, now this is not even spoken word, because spoken word is much more complex. This is written word, and you want to translate a word from easy Zulu to English or vice versa. You will realize that it is better at translating words that are written in English into Easy Zulu than it is able to translate words that are written in Easy Zulu to English. Why? Because the people who created that system are not Easy Zulu speakers. They are English speakers, which basically tells you that context, getting the people who speak the language to be involved in the development of technology is very, very, very important. Secondly, it tells us that the people who work in that area must not only just understand how to program, they must also understand linguistics. In other words, the computer scientists should not just be trained as computer scientists, they should also be trained as as uh, linguists, very, very important. Not too long ago, we did a study of uh, creating a system where we will speak to it in uh, Sisutu Salibua. That is one of our 11 languages. And then you will speak to the machine in Sisutu Salibua or Spedi, and then the machine will translate that into English. It was fairly successful. Then we tried it on Isi Kosa. That is the language that is spoken in our Cape provinces, predominantly. That was when our problem started. Every time there was a click, the machine will think it is noise and it will filter it out. So no, this can't be acceptable. How can a system uh, basically fail spectacularly to understand the language. Then when you went and actually started understanding the, ba the, the, the basics of Isi Kosa, we realized that no, 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 no. Isi Kosa is actually a, a combination of two types of languages. One type, which is the predominant part of Isi Kosa, is the Bantu languages. Bantu languages are one of the most spoken languages in our continent. They are spoken all the way from South Africa to, to Kenya, and sometimes to, uh, to um, uh, 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 you know, all, all, all through in the Congo. Um, uh, so so, so th th that is the Bantu languages. And in fact, some of us, when we travel across the continent and when people speak, you can actually hear you know, and the reason is because the words are still similar. Then the second component of Isi Kosa, which is actually only 5% of the language, is Khoisan languages. Khoi Khoi, the languages of the first people of South Africa, uh, the Khoisan. And it is, it, the Khoisan languages are clicking languages. So, the words, all the words are clicks, which means if you were to train a machine with Khoisan language, it won't have a problem because the character of the
the language is the same. It becomes a problem when the clicks are in easy closer because the character of the languages is two. You have the easy closer part, you have the run to part that does not click, where the intensity of the words are, are not high, and you have the, 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 the coisan part where the intensity are, are high, uh, but, but, but they happen much, much uh, less frequently. So, because of this, because artificial intelligence is automating things that are done by human beings, it has all sorts of implications on our lives. The first implication is that it is making the workplace have fewer and fewer number of people. So if you go to a factory today, you will find fewer and fewer people working in factories because some of the tasks that used to be done by human beings are being done by machines. In fact, the task parts that are done by machines are increasing exponentially. Because of that, we are entering what is called the post-work era. Secondly, our freedoms are being compromised. If you are connected to Facebook or Twitter, you basically give Facebook or Twitter the permission to monitor all your movements in exchange of you using their product. In that case, they give it to you for free because you are the product. Your data is the product that they can be able to take and sell uh, to people. They, we know about its impact on democracy. Uh, we know now that uh, um, uh, Cambridge Analytica, the role it played, uh, the role it played to make sure that uh, Donald Trump was elected. So all these things are happening around us. And Hello? Uh, 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 because all these things are happening around us, we, as the uh, uh, institution of higher learning, what do we do about it? The World Economic Forum did a study where they were asking, what are the core skills that we require in the fourth industrial revolution? The core skills that uh, we require are problem solving skills, ability to think critically, ability to work with people, social skills. Now, how do we create our education system so that all those skills are encompassed? I was an undergraduate student in North America. And now I understand why the Germans are not as prominent in this new type of uh, economy, data-based economy, such as uh, uh, social media type of companies, um, uh, such as uh, e-commerce. And, uh, and if you think about it, if you think of Germany, you think of their impressive cars that they make, uh, um, so they are technologically very adept. Why have they been left behind in these new types of economy? And the reason for that, and this is my speculation, is that their educational system is too specialized. I was a PhD student in England at the University of Cambridge. And what I saw in England is that when people are doing the last two years of their high school, they call that A-levels, they're already specialized. If they are going to do engineering, they probably will take physics, chemistry, mathematics, 
and some course called general um, subject. Whereas if you go to North America, and I, trans I transferred from the University of Cape Town uh, to, uh, to North America as an undergraduate student, you will realize that even the undergraduate qualification is actually multidisciplinary. When I arrived in the United States, they told me that I have to take 12 semesters of human and social science courses. And six of them must be in one discipline. So I took six economic classes. Then the balance can be anything you want. So I took history of South Africa. And in that uh, class, uh, there were two sets of books that were uh, prescribed. One was uh, History of South Africa by Martin Legasic. And Martin Legasic is the founder of an organization called Abaklani Basem Jondolo, uh, who was a professor at the uh, University of Western Cape. And the other book that they wanted me to read was a book written by a Rhodes uh, professor, uh, Professor Jeff Paris. Uh, he wrote a book called The Dead Shall Arise, about the, the, the history of cattle killing in, uh, in Eastern Cape. I never really appreciated that at the time. But now I do. Uh, if we are going to be creating an intelligence system that will look into text and summarize what uh, the texts are, what, what the book is saying, a machine that does that, I, the person who does that must surely have written or have read about history and so on and so forth. So the reason why the Americans have been very successful uh, in this new type of economies is because their educational system is very multidisciplinary. Mark Zuckerberg was studying computer science and psychology uh, at Harvard uh, before he dropped out. If you come to South Africa, and I'm sure uh, 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 to many parts of uh, the African continent, you will realize that if you are doing computer science, you will hardly find somebody who is doing computer science and uh, psychology as a major. So all we need to do is to make sure that our educational uh, system of education is multidisciplinary. Now I'm going to come to an end of my talk. I will end with uh, the recommendations of the Fourth Industrial Revolution Commission. We have come together, we have engaged, and then we came up with eight sets of recommendations that will make sure that South Africa and Africa have, have a stake in the fourth industrial revolution. The first recommendation is to invest in human capacity development in areas of the fourth industrial revolution. And many people, and I see it in our government, they think it means we should teach our children how to cope. That is not the case. If you want your children to learn how to cope, you need to teach them three things. You need to teach them language. They need to know how to speak in a language. It can be Venda in my case. It can be Isi Zulu. It can be uh, um, uh, Kiswahili. Uh, it can be uh, Igbo. It can be Yoruba. Whatever it is, the children must learn how to express themselves in the form of language. Uh, second, you should teach them how to think logically. And if you look at our curriculum, we don't really know where logical thinking fits in. Sadly, we should teach them to be able to understand numbers, mathematics. That's, those are the basics that you need in order to be able to cope very, very important. So we need to invest in human capacity development, which means a tertiary level, multidisciplinary education, at basic level, conceptual, teaching people conceptual things. Yeah, at the University of Johannesburg, we just published a book on artificial intelligence for children. 
because we believe that children must be able to conceptually learn about these technologies as early as possible. The second recommendation is to establish the South Africa's National Artificial Intelligence Institute. And the president of the country, um, uh, Mr. Cyril Ramaphosa, uh, when he accepted uh, the chairmanship of the African Union, he basically said he wants to establish the Africa AI Forum, where Africans are going to engage on matters of AI and what it is actually doing uh, to our society. Then the third recommendation is on manufacturing. South Africa has been deindustrializing. It has been deindustrializing because we have not invested in, the, in technology. And if you go to China today, you will realize that much of the production is actually done by machines. So we need to invest into technology to make sure that the deindustrialization that has happened in South Africa is actually reversed. And the fourth recommendation is about data. We should develop data capacity. And there are two things we are supposed to do. Data storage and data processing. And today we don't even have to build data centers. We can actually be able to buy a cloud. Of course, there are issues around security, cyber security that we should deal with. But certainly, we don't have to invest, uh, invent a wheel. This will naturally mean that we need to think about what, you, what we do with our data. There is um, a story now where they say data is the new oil. If it is the new oil, are we measuring how much data Facebook or Twitter or Google are mining from the African continent every second and are we taxing it? Very, very important. Then the fifth recommendation is about incentivizing the fourth industrial revolution. I think it's Robert Schiller, I might be wrong, Nobel Prize winner Robert Schiller, who was asked, describe to me the whole of economics in one way. And his answer was incentives. If you incentivize people, then demand and supply will happen, production will happen, and so on and so forth. So for us to be able to get our countries and our industries to be competitive, we need to incentivize them to invest in these technologies. It can be through tax breaks. In South Africa, we're using a, a strategy that was used by the Chinese called the special economic zones, where you have an area that is designated a special economic zone, and then the laws are much more favorable to the companies that are operating there. We need to invest in fire infrastructure. If our connectivity is poor, we are not going to be able to succeed to take our, our country into the fourth industrial revolution. The sixth recommendation is that we need to look at all our, our laws and see whether our laws are in line with the fourth industrial revolution. Just to give you an example, a few years back, I went to a uh, vendor where I come from with my family. We are five, I have three children. And my parents told me that, hey, you have a big family. Uh, we are not going to be able to accommodate you. You are on your own. So what I did was to go and book a, ho a, a, a house using an app, an American app called Airbnb. I don't come from an urban area, I come from a rural area. I was shocked to find out that I can actually book a house using Airbnb effectively in my village. I was able to do that. Of course, Airbnb does not operate in South Africa. It does not even have an office. It is not even text. Uh, it's not tax because it's not domiciled in, in South Africa. Isn't it time we start, we have to start thinking about what the meaning of being domiciled is? 
If you are operating, maybe you are domicile uh, in South Africa, at least for the type of business you're doing in the country. So we need to create new laws and update existing laws so that all these things, how do you tax these uh, platform companies? Um, how do you regulate the use of data? Uh, how do you make sure that uh, these machines do not discriminate against people? And finally, uh, we had the recommendation of implementation. Uh, develop an implementation council. Because here in South Africa, we talk too much and do too little. So it's time to start implementing things. And uh, we recommend that. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to open the floor for questions. Thank you, Prof. Monwala. Um, there are a number of, number of questions that have come up uh, that I can relate to you so long. So it was one around, um, I think which is, which is quite important is the how money comes in and how do we democratize for IR? I mean, I think democratizing for IR is to be involved. Uh, to be involved actually means we, our people must actually understand it. Our politicians must understand it. Uh, there was um, uh, something that happened in our parliament where uh, I think it was a member of the Economic Freedom Fighters, Dr. Ndlose, Ndlose, asked our deputy president what the fourth industrial revolution was all about. What I learned about that whole experience is that Science literacy is part of the democratization of uh, technology. Because if we simply do not understand it, we are going to be its slaves, not its masters. If uh, uh, in our countries we don't have people who are experts in these uh, technologies, then the people are actually going to be slaves, not uh, masters. And there, there are a number of things that, uh, that, that are happening to democratize this. There is an organization called Deep Learning in Daba. Deep Learning in Daba basically teaches artificial intelligence in the African continent. They are operating in 33 different countries. I'm very impressed about the number of conferences that they did. I'm quite glad that one of uh, 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 the founders of, in fact, the brain behind the deep learning uh, in Daba is a gentleman called uh, Dr. Um, Shakir Mohammed, uh, who uh, uh, works for Google in, in London. Uh, he was my master's student uh, uh, about 16 years ago. Part of democratizing uh, this. Uh, if you look uh, in, in Ghana, uh, uh, Google has opened an AI office. They invested a billion dollar. Do we even understand what it takes for the company to invest a billion dollar? It means they have seen value. What is that value? Do we know about it? Is it in our interest or in the interest of Google? All those questions are very important in the democratization of uh, technology. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, so a lot of folks saying very insightful, uh, educative, folks are enjoying uh, the, the conversation. We have a question here. Um, so we, we have a challenge across uh, Africa in that three hours happened unevenly across the continent. Uh, many universities have poor electricity supply, shaky networks, poor internet connections. Can we jump straight into 4IR? Look, I mean, uh, um, uh, I don't think it's either or. I think we should do all these things. Uh, we, 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 we should not wait uh, until all our um, villages are electrified. Uh, because we do know that uh, 
uh, there are people who uh, are now having uh, solar, solar technologies in their houses. Uh, here in South Africa, we do have uh, 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 low income housing that is supplied by government that actually has solar uh, energy uh, connected to it. So I don't think we should uh, allow ourselves to be left behind. We should do all these things now um, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, energy is a big issue in Africa. Funny enough, connectivity is becoming a, a big success in Africa. Uh, a great deal of people now have access to some form of a cell phone, uh, cellular uh, communication. You know? So we are making progress. Uh, uh, it might not be enough, but uh, those are very important. And we need to put pressure on our governments that uh, for 4 IR requires energy. Whenever you have a computer, you must know that energy is needed. Whether to cool down the computer, that is why when you have your laptop, after 10 minutes, uh, it's very hot. So those fans require energy. They eat energy like, like, like nobody's business. If you look at um, data centers, energy is a big issue. We need to think about renewable energy and other forms of energy, especially in Africa. I mean, we have not even exploited the, the commodity dam, the dam potential in the DRC. Apparently that dam, if we could think strategically, could be able to offer electricity to the entire African continent. What is the African Union doing about this? I think that is actually quite important. Hmm, thanks for sharing that with us. And then um, I guess what the pandemic is showing us and making very visible are the inequalities around connectivity, uh, energy, all those kinds of things. There's a fascinating question here around uh, Curriculum transformation comes from Dion Nkomo. He asks, with the example of political scientists needing training in technology in the context of 4IR, how do we conceptualize curriculum transformation for humanities and social sciences? Is this an argument for digital humanities? No, I mean, what I would just tell you what we did at the University of Johannesburg. We have introduced two sets of subjects that we expect all our first year students to do. The first subject is actually introduction to artificial intelligence. All our students have to take it. We're not saying when you take it, you will come out uh, as, uh, as a big programmer uh, in artificial intelligence. You won't, because we won't teach you how to program. We'll teach you about what it is. We'll teach you about uh, the philosophy behind it. We'll teach you about how it can be applied. We'll teach you about all its implications on democracy, on, on provision of water, of energy, and so on and so forth. It's a light subject. Everybody is supposed to take it. The second one is uh, the new uh, course that we introduced for all our first year students called Africa Insights Model Module. So it, there, African literature, African politics, African economy uh, or African political economy so that our people can actually be able to understand the environments around them. So that is an example of a curriculum reform. And then the, we added a, a third component that was stopped by COVID-19. We say we are very unsatisfied about our our students' ability to understand the rest of the African continent. So we introduce a, 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 a you know a, a project called Africa by Bus. We were taking about four thousand students every year to the rest of the African continent by bus, and we wanted it to be done by bus because we want them to see problems, and we are encouraging them that whatever problems you you see. Be thinking about the solutions and present the solution, whether it is the problem of water, whether it is the problem of communication, whether it is the electricity problem, whether it is the problem of uh, commerce. Please think about the solutions. You know, um, uh, we managed to take our students to Namibia, Botswana, Mozambique, Zimbabwe, and, uh, and, and Zambia. This year, we we're hoping to take them to Kampala via Kigali. 
Wow, that sounds exciting. I wouldn't mind being a student in that program. Yeah. Um, there's one on round. Um, actually, I'm going to mention, I think this one is, how does teaching for 4IR change the nature of the university? No, look, I mean, I think, um, I mean, uh, uh, there are two elements. How we teach and what we teach. For I add is changing how we teach. We know how we are teaching uh, online platforms. By the way, this is actually just the beginning because I'm not seeing virtual reality in any of our universities where somebody can teach as if they're standing in front of you. Um, there was uh, an event which I attended where the president of South Africa was speaking uh, while he was in, uh, uh, in, in Johannesburg and uh, about 300 kilometers away in Northwest, uh, there was an audience that was seeing him in front, a hologram of him, you know, that we have not brought into teaching. So why are this teaching is changing how we teach online platforms. Uh, more means of communicating in class, group discussions, uh, and so on and so forth. That is changing and we are seeing it and COVID has actually accelerated that. The second one is what we teach. It has to be multidisciplinary. If your curriculum is not multidisciplinary, you are not ready for the fourth industrial revolution. That means curriculum reform. Thank you. Yeah, good point here. Isn't online learning three IR? Uh, could you clarify for us, Prof Marwala? No, no, it depends on what you're doing. If you are doing virtual reality, it's almost it's four IR. Uh, if you are doing virtual experiments using um, um, uh, um, in interactive reality, uh, that is four IR. If what you are doing is um, uh, basically uh, 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 recording a lecture and, and, and uploading it, then I'm afraid that is three, uh, three IR. I think that is actually quite important. Yes, indeed. So, I mean, many of us think we're doing 4IR and we're actually not doing 4IR. Um, yeah, I know in my context, many of our students are even battling with the connectivity to download a 12 megabyte app for our learning, learning management system. Um, I think related to the question about how does teaching change the nature of the university, it's also about how do educators um, need to change. So are those of us in education ready for um, providing students with the multidisciplinary opportunities needed for Africa to benefit from 4IR? How can educators transform themselves? Well, I think they need to learn, they need to read, they need to develop new skills. For example, uh, 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 you know, just on technology, they need to understand technology. Uh, just on, uh, 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 and how do we do it? Unfortunately, you have lots of uh, online platforms where you can go and learn about uh, the impact of artificial intelligence in international relations, for example, or in medicine, or in politics, or in psychology, all those things. I think it's really learning that is going to prepare us. Thank you. So our own capacity development um, as educators is going to be quite mm -hmm. crucial. Um, just a reminder to folks, we do have a, a little evaluation form. Tony, if you can paste the link into the chat again. So before you leave, please, please make sure you provide some feedback uh, for us on this event. Um, there's still so many questions, but I realize it's nearly four o'clock. Can we keep you on a little bit longer, Prof Mawala, to engage Maybe with somebody? Maybe just for 10 minutes. 10 minutes, 10 minutes, minutes perfect. More. That's totally fine. <laughs> Thanks so much. Um, Okay, so then uh, John uh, Edu Madze asked uh, what papers, you mentioned some papers, he said how can we get access to them? I think those are the no, ones, the government ones you were talking about. Um, 
obviously they uh, 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 there are many types of papers you have books that you can buy you have uh, publications uh, articles that many of them you can be able to get them on the internet uh, you have uh, uh, policies that we um, that we uh, uh, like the fourth industrial revolution reports that are actually going to be available for for, 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 for the public. So I think if you contact me, I can be able to refer you to resources. Okay, cool. And maybe we can put them in the Facebook event page. I think uh, perhaps it was the white papers that you were referring to and your collection of uh, the series of uh, articles. Mm -hmm. I can't remember if it was for the conversation or which publication it was mm -hmm. for. Well, I mean, uh, there, there are lots. I mean, uh, I, 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 one of the things that I do is to try to write as much as possible for the benefit of the ordinary people. So uh, I write for, in the Daily Maverick, which you can be able to download the articles for free on what is artificial intelligence, how, uh, how is artificial intelligence being used uh, in COVID, uh, to tackle the issues of COVID, um, you know, all the recommendations that uh, I talked about, there is an article written on Mail uh, and Guardian for each one of them. You know, all of these are available. And once you collectively read uh, uh, these articles, you pretty much are on the way of being an expert in the field. Mm. Wonderful, thank you. So we've got to keep reading. And, uh, and then I, 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 I will send you the links. Okay, wonderful. Thanks. Um, uh, Puti, just a note. So the recording of this uh, session will be on the Emerge Africa YouTube channel. Uh, so you'll be able to find a recording there and share it with your colleagues. Um, yeah, so Francis had a good point here. He said, it seems that uh, context, content and concepts are for are for our are crucial to the oil of the future. Um, and then I guess that was around data and then a question of how do we develop data capacity in countries of data and digital inequality? Um, well, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, obviously through education. Of course, uh, government must make sure that uh, 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 you know, telecommunication companies are uh, selling data at a, a cost-effective manner. But uh, now you have courses such as data science. By the way, data science, uh, this thing called data science now, is nothing but um, a major in statistics and, uh, and computer science. If your major is statistics uh, and computer science, you are actually a data scientist. Yeah, thanks for clarifying that. So folks, if you've studied those things or teaching it, you're probably well on your way um, <laughs> and ready. Um, yeah, I think we've, we've reached our time. Uh, folks, there is a, we can continue the discussion on our Facebook event page and we'll share the resources, um, Prof. Mawara mentioned uh, there as well. So thank you very much for joining us today, um, Prof. Thank you. Thank, thank um, you very much. And for in answering all our questions and we wish you a wonderful day further and a great weekend. Thank you very much and, and you too. I hope you are going to get time to relax. <laughs> we'll try. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. And we'll, as mentioned, we'll share resources on the event page as well. Okay. okay have thank a great... you. Awesome. Have a great weekend, everyone. Bye. Bye. Thanks for joining. Bye.